Good morning. Very good morning. It's great to be with you again. Uh, thanks for having me back after last night. And there's a lot of echo or feedback on this. I don't know if that's, there we go. Um, so it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, some of them not so good to see. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're probably thinking that about me. But um, and great to meet new people. It's great to be here again. Um, I think this is probably the fourth time that I've been here. Um, it's, but, but it's been a while. I think it's been about seven or eight years. since. Too long, too long definitely. Uh, so it's great to be back. And in fact, my wife missed you guys so much that she was willing to fly down here uh, yesterday from Kentucky down to Atlanta. So I picked her up at the airport, and she wanted to see you guys. So. Um, yeah, um, normally she doesn't like to leave the house, and so she was excited to see you guys. <laughs> but I'm glad she can join me for the last leg of my trip. I've been in North Carolina and Georgia and now South Carolina, and looking forward to being home tonight, Lord willing. Um, so we're going to be talking a bit about the resurrection and our eternal destiny. This talk will probably be a little different than what you might expect. Um, it would be great for me to be able to go into detail about how wonderful our eternity is going to be. And we'll get a little bit of that, but it's not going to be in great detail. What I want to do is talk about the way that we actually talk about the our eternal state and what it's going to be like. And if the words we use maybe are giving the wrong impression a lot of times and to our detriment, maybe, or to the church's detriment. Um, before I jump into that, let me... Um, let me start by getting this out of the way first. A lot of people have been asking about the flash drives that we've got and what's on there. So real quickly, it's got several of the books that I've got, um, a couple movies for you uh, that I made with Eric Hovind. I didn't realize they were going to actually be movies. I thought I was just going to be interviewed at the, at the museum and at the Ark, and he turned them into movies. And they're kind of spoofs of the Night at the Museum. They're kind of fun and goofy and silly. So uh, they're available on there as well. Um, so that flash drive comes with a bunch of videos, a bunch of, um, so all of my videos I think are on there. It also has PowerPoints for my uh, resurrection series, which is uh, 12 sessions on six discs. Uh, so it's got all the PowerPoints, plus all the videos for that. Um, it's also got some debates that I've done and a bunch of other materials. So that's on there. And so we sell that for $50. So if you're wondering if that's on there, and people have asked if the Fallen book is on there. Yep, it is. So, all right, let's get the resources out of the way. I don't want to deal with that at the end because I want to end on a high note talking about the gospel and Jesus Christ, not here's what I wrote. So that's, that's at the beginning. But um, so as we jump into this, let me tell you about an exhibit that we made at the Creation Museum. And I should have shown you some pictures, but a lot of you guys were there recently. And you remember the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit. If you went into that, you can't forget it. It's extraordinary. Um, I work with people who are so extremely talented artistically. I can't even make a stick figure very well or can't draw one very well. And they made these little baby models that are so realistic, so lifelike through 3D printing, through silicon uh, molds and all that. Just so many amazing things that they've done. And they look so lifelike. We have people asking why we put like dead babies on display. And we didn't. They're just models. But they're so lifelike. And... Um, but in that exhibit, I was responsible for writing the content, and one of the signs that we decided to put in there is, I call it, speaking of the unborn. And the reason I wanted to do that, I, wanted pe I want people to think about how we talk about this issue. Because words are important, and the words we choose to use convey a message to people, correct? Yeah. So how many times do you hear somebody talk about the baby in the womb and refer to that baby as it? rather than he or she. But don't we do that regularly? And what impression does that give to the people who've already been taught this child in the womb is nothing but a blob of cells? Do we not play right into their hands by referring to the baby as it all the time? Now, I'm not trying to be harsh and critical of everybody. I understand that if you don't know if this is a he or she, then it is an acceptable use of the pronoun grammatically. But what message is that it depersonalizes this little human being, right? Or how about this? When the mom is about three months along and she says, I'm going to be a mother. Or her parents say, I'm going to be a grandmother, a grandfather. No, you already are. And you have been for three months. Okay? Just think about how we talk about this issue and then how it plays right into the hands of the other side. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So if you say, I'm going to be a mother, then you're implying that you're not already when you have been for three months. That's a little baby that's grown inside of you. So just think about how we talk about 
those situations and the impact that can have if you choose to say, yeah, I'm, I'm already a mother. I've been for three. Or when um, people ask me if I've got any grandkids. I do. I haven't been able to hold them at all, but my, my daughter, you know, tragically has had an ectopic pregnancy and, uh, you know, it's been very tough on her, but um, someday I'll get to meet that grandkid. And I'm older than my daughter, so I think I'll get to meet her first, him or her. <laughs> so, and I can't wait for that. But um, and in fact, I'll get to talk about that issue a little bit as we go. So with that in mind, I want you to think about how we think about eternity and the words that we use. And as we jump into that topic, I want to talk about how we're supposed to take God at his word and, and use you know, the, the plain meaning of the text. And let me give you a few examples where people clearly are not doing that. So I'm going to give you a couple of very clear examples, and then we're going to show how that relates to the topic that we've got at hand today. So the golden, quote-unquote, golden rule of hermeneutics is what a lot of people have used. Um, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense lest you make nonsense. Okay? Um, so it doesn't mean don't ever dig deeper. Of course you do. But there are times where it makes perfect sense the way it reads, and you don't have to try to find a deeper or read between the lines or change the meaning because God knows how to communicate to people. Okay, he's the one who invented language, and he can communicate to us. So in other words, interpret each passage in plain sense according to its genre, as we talked about last night. Consider the grammar, the culture, the geography, the history, all those things. Keep that background information in mind so you know how the original audience, or try to figure out how the original audience would have understood that, and then interpret the grammar, the syntax, in a straightforward manner according to the rules for, or the principles for that style of, of writing. Um, obviously, poetry and apocalyptic literature have different principles than your uh, historical narrative, but you still according, interpret according to the plain language. All right, so let's take a look at some of, an example of somebody who is ignoring the plain meaning of the text. Okay, Genesis chapter 7, the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, let's take a look at that wording, we're covered. Here's what the, um, the theological word book of the Old Testament says. In Genesis 7, 19 and 20, the hills were covered. The Hebrew does not specify with what. The NIV specification of water goes beyond the Hebrew. So we look at that verse again. The waters, the Hebrew word is mayim, prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, mayim. And the waters, Maim, prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. What do you think they might have been covered with? Air? Well, that's hardly profound. They're always covered with air. Blood? That's not in the context. It's talking about the water going up higher and higher and prevailing and dominating on the earth, and the mountains were covered. What, do you poss what could possibly have covered the mountains? Obviously the water. It's mentioned right there. In the verse, why are they doing that? Because they want to teach a local flood. And so they're completely ignoring what the text itself says and trying to get around that. And all you have to do is just look at what it says. So how about this one? Now, this one might be a little bit more difficult, but because um, the Bible, here, here's what it says, right? But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen? Absolutely, that's true. But don't we hear from so many people that nobody can seek after God? And nobody seeks after God. That's what Romans 3 says, right? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. And we'll hear certain people quote this verse and never mention the other one. Never mention that. It says God has rewarded those who diligently seek him. They just quote this one. Nobody seeks after God. Okay, well, what do you do with these verses? And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Sure, it looks like there are people who seek him and that they can seek him, right? Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of verses that said that. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul is in Athens and he's preaching there, he's speaking... He talks about the, that God divided the nations. He's referring back to the time of Babel, and he says why he did that. He says he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Why? So that they should seek the Lord. That's why he did it. 
in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So the same guy who wrote Romans said this. So how can we say that nobody seeks after God? Well, how about if we look at the context of that passage in Romans? As it is written, notice he's quoting from different places. These are a whole bunch of verses from the Psalms and from Isaiah. And what he's doing is putting together a list of characteristics of what the wicked people are like and what they do. He's not saying this applies to every single person all the time and they're all like this every time. And this is kind of a description of what wicked people are like. And look what he says. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Yeah, if you look at the psalm where that's from, it can contrast those people with the righteous people who do those things, who do the right things. So he's not saying nobody does it. They have all turned aside. They have, all, they have be, together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. Their, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Does that describe every single unbeliever in the world? No, there's some people who wouldn't even hurt a fly. They're so pacifistic. And by the way, I'm not saying that, that that's a bad thing. I'm not trying to say that as a negative thing. I'm just saying that verse doesn't describe every single unbeliever in the world throughout history. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace that they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So it's a, he's giving a general description of what wicked people are like. He's not saying that this describes every single person on earth all the time. And yet when you pull that one verse out of context, it makes it sound like nobody ever seeks God. And yet there's a whole bunch of verses that say they do. And so by doing that, they force the Bible to contradict itself or they give the wrong message because they are trying to push a certain theology that doesn't match the rest of Scripture. All right, how about this one? I, and I did a paper on this during my doctoral program about First Peter, who it was written to. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Pastor Ritt, who's the dispersion? The Jews, okay? It's a Jew who is living outside of Israel. That's what it's always meant, okay? In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, okay? So who is First Peter written to? Jews who are not living in Israel. That's what it tells us. And it tells us where they're staying at this point, the ones he had written to. Except, if you look at our commentaries today, nearly every single modern commentary changes the meaning of the word diaspora to mean Christians, more specifically, Gentile Christians. The exact opposite of what it means. So there's some uh, MacArthur, Schreiner, Grudem, Longman, Marshall, McKnight, Michael, all of them say this is written to Gentile believers. The exact opposite of what Peter actually said. So they reinterpret the Old Testament quotations in there when it talks about you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood from Exodus to the Jews. No, that's not about the Jews. That's about the church. But it's not about the church. Okay? So they reapply all those promises to the church. But what's the problem with that? Well, for, again, these words that are used there, pilgrims, dispersion, elect, uh, dispersion always referred to, refers to the Jews. Pilgrims and elect nearly every single time it's used in Scripture is referring to the Jews. Um, the church fathers claimed it was written to the Jews. Who's the one who wrote this letter? Peter. Peter. He was the apostle to the the circumcision, the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, so why is Peter suddenly writing to the Gentiles? He's not. The readers in this psalm, or sorry, in this letter, are twice contrasted with Gentiles, meaning that they are not Gentiles. And so people will look at the plain meaning of the word and completely flip it because they want to fit their theology that they've got in modern times. That completely contradicts what Peter says. And then people will use the words in those chapters and completely misunderstand the text and misapply it. Okay? So it's so important for us to pay close attention to the text. In each one of these examples, somebody's theology or their interpretive framework overrode the plain meaning of the text. Okay? And I'm not saying that the people who did that are horrible, evil, rotten people and they are just the worst sinners. That's not my point. It's just that they've got a theology that is, that is causing them or leading them to completely misapply or misinterpret the text. And it's so important for us to actually look at what the text says. And there's a lot of other examples we can go through. So let's get into our topic then. And as we do, I want to read from Revelation chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. It should be easy to find. Second to last chapter in the Bible. Okay, very end of the Bible. Revelation 21.
And we'll start at verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> it reminds me of 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is yeah. death. Yeah. Someday death is going to die, and that will be a glorious day for those who believe. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and they shall be my son, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And we can... Uh, Let me read the next few verses and then we'll stop. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And if you look down a little bit later uh, in verse 21, it talks about how each of those gates was a great pearl. Okay? Uh, So we can go on and read that entire description if you want, and I'd encourage you to do that later on. But that's going to come back as we start talking about this topic this morning. So what is heaven going to be like? Well, what do you think it's, how it's portrayed in our culture today? How about something like this? (laughs) Isn't that one of the ideas that we get? Or how about this one? Welcome to heaven, here's your harp. Welcome to hell, here's your accordion. (laughs) I was in Duluth, Minnesota, and I shared this slide on a presentation I gave before, and the that everybody erupted in laughter. And I thought, I know it's funny, but it's not that funny. There's something wrong. And I realized they were all looking at the pastor who was sitting like in the front row. And he said, I'm an accordion player. He's not just, <laughs> not just an accordion player. He teaches at the schools and he's got like five CDs on accordion. And I said, fine, just change it to bagpipes. And they all started laughing and looked at the guy who was sitting over here. <laughs> I said, that's all right. And they knew I was from Green Bay. I said, that's all right. I was, what it really says, welcome to heaven. Here's your Packers jersey. Welcome to hell. And they're like, don't say it. Because <laughs> I was going to say Vikings. <laughs> they were going to listen to everything I had to say from then on, which was, it was pretty fun. But of all places to share that. Uh, so. <laughs> so, but isn't this sort of the idea we get a lot of times? Something like that. We're just floating on clouds, playing a harp, that sort of thing. Or we get this picture, right? Something, something like that in our minds when we talk about eternity, that it's just going to be this ethereal place of light and just kind of spiritual, right? But is that how the Bible describes it? Is that what we just read? It's not what we just read. So here's from uh, Mark Twain, or sorry, yeah, Mark Twain wrote this in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Finn stated about Miss Watson. She went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was go around all day with, with a harp and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and he, she said, not by a considerable sight. I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. Isn't that interesting? You know, how many times have you heard some, something like this where somebody who's an unbeliever says, well, I'll just party with all my friends in hell because heaven sounds boring. And it sounds more appealing in some sense, doesn't it? Um, Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven, I'm going to quote from this one several times. I think it's a fantastic book, and I'd recommend it if if you haven't read it yet. A pastor once confessed to me, whenever I think about heaven, it makes me depressed. It's a pastor saying that. I'd rather just cease to exist when I die. Why, I asked. I can't stand the thought of that endless tedium, to float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a harp. It's all so terribly boring. Heaven doesn't sound much better than hell. I'd rather be annihilated than spend eternity in a place like that. Isn't that awful? 
But the way he described heaven is it doesn't it match the way that a lot of people describe it, even in the church. So how many of you have heard or just think that it's going to be a 24 hour, 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 day a year praise service? Isn't that kind of how it's portrayed? But that's, for some people, that sounds really boring. And I, I hope that doesn't sound unspiritual or anything. But we're going to have more to do than just that. There, that will be part of it, I think, but not all day, every day. So as we try to think correctly about eternity, let's look at these three topics. The nature of Christ's resurrection body, which will relate to the nature of our resurrection body, which will relate to the nature of our eternal home. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover, these three things. So let's first of all look at the nature of Christ's resurrection body. It is physical, as in physical, tangible, touchable, not spiritual, ethereal. Okay? Uh, here's what we have. So when Mary Magdalene gets to see Jesus, for the, she's the first one who sees the resurrected Lord. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. What was she doing? Hanging. Presumably she was hanging onto his feet or something and clinging to him. And he said, don't do that. For I have yet to ascend. I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. In other words, don't cling to me because he's got a physical body that she could cling to. Uh, how about the other women? It says in Matthew, and as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him because he could be touched. He could be held. Okay. And then how about in Luke 24? So when he's walking with, with the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He's walking along with them and talking with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. It doesn't say they couldn't see him. Obviously, they knew somebody was there. They were talking to him. And they carried on a conversation. He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have had with one another as you walk and are sad? Um, so at the end of their walk, they get to where they were going. It says, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it. He obviously was physical enough to pick up the bread and break it. Okay? Not spiritual in the sense of not a body. Okay? Um, he had a physical body. But then it says he vanished from their sight. So it's not the same sort of thing that we have today. It's glorified. It's a resurrected, glorified body, an incorruptible body as we'll talk about. How about with, with Thomas? You know, we, we kind of rip on Thomas, call him Doubting Thomas and everything, but uh, because, which is kind of sad, I was telling this to somebody last night, um, Thomas didn't demand anything that the rest of the disciples demanded. Remember when, when Mary Magdalene told them that he had written? They didn't believe. They wanted to see for themselves, and then they got to, but Thomas wasn't there. So when they told Thomas, he's like, well, I'm not going to believe till I see. And then he got to see. Uh, so he was really just like the rest of them. But throughout history, he's going to be called Doubting Thomas. The poor guy's probably with the Lord right now like, oh, seriously, another pastor said that? <laughs> um, and you know what? He might actually be one of the boldest of any of them. If you look back at John 11 with Lazarus, that account, where Jesus said he's going to go, and he's like, let us go too so we can die with him. And we read that in Doubting Thomas' voice, oh, we're like Eeyore, oh, bother, we're going to go die too. What if? He's like, yeah, let's go. We'll die for you. Maybe that's how he said it. Anyways, that's a little side note. But he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it in my side. How could he do that if this is just a spiritual entity hovering there, you know, just this ghost-like figure? Well, obviously it wasn't. This is the resurrected, glorified Jesus. And he, Thomas could have touched him. He never says he did. It just says that he said, my Lord and my God, which is the correct response to Jesus because that's who he is. So... There are objections to this. There are some people who claim that it was just a spiritual resurrection. And this actually comes from people who are, in many circles, very well respected. I'm not saying that these people are not Christians, but they have a very distorted or had a very distorted view of this. Uh, this one comes from George Eldon Ladd, who is a very, uh, has been a very well respected uh, Christian teacher in the last century. And he believed in a spiritual resurrection of Jesus. So if you see the red bars on the side, I put that on there so you know that this is not a good thing, okay? Just to help you distinguish between the blue slides where we're recording scripture and the, if you see red, I'm not endorsing what they're saying, okay? That's a little help to you guys. Here's what he says. We may conclude this chapter by asking, uh, this is from his book, I Believe in the Resurrection of Jesus. So he's trying to affirm the resurrection of Jesus, but look what he says. 
We may conclude this chapter by asking what, according to the gospel witness, actually happened at the moment of resurrection. The answer is that Jesus was raised from the realm of mortal men into the unseen world of God. The resurrection appearances were not the resurrection itself. They were momentary appearances of the invisible risen Lord to the physical sight and senses of the disciples. Oh, it's like a hologram. No. Oh, he goes on. What would an observer have seen if he stood inside the tomb watching the dead body of Jesus? This must be speculation, but we believe it is based directly upon the witness of the Gospels. All he would have seen was the sudden and inexplicable disappearance of the body of Jesus. No. He would have seen that body stand back up. In fact, that's what the Greek word means in re for resurrection, to stand again. That's what he would have seen. The body would have gotten up and gotten out of the, the cloth that he was buried in and then walked out of the tomb. That's what an observer would have seen. It's not a disappearance. It's not a spiritual resurrection. It's a physical, bodily resurrection. Murray Harris said this, but it is not historical in the sense of being an, an incident that was observed by witnesses or even an incident that could have been observed by mortal gaze. We've already noted that there were no witnesses of the resurrection itself and that in his resurrected state, Jesus was not normally visible to the human eye. No, he was visible. It's just sometimes they didn't recognize him, that, like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It didn't say they couldn't see him. They just didn't recognize him. There's a big difference. So these people are denying the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. They're saying that he just rose spiritually. So why would they do that? Well, we're going to see why in a little while. It'll relate back to what we've been talking about. Remember the picture of floating on the clouds? Because that's their view of eternity. It impacts the way that they interpret Jesus' resurrection. It impacts the way they interpret our resurrection. They spiritualize everything because they have a mindset that, that almost like the Gnostic mindset that the physical, earthly is evil and bad and we need to escape it and get to the spiritual. So how could Jesus' body be physical? I mean, how could that resurrection be physical? Because that's bad. We have to get out of that. That's what the Corinthians struggled with. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15. Why well, you have 58 verses all on the physical bodily resurrection because the Greeks couldn't stand that idea because they had that philosophical mindset that the physical world was bad. When God made the world, he looked at everything he had made, and indeed it was? Good. It was very good. Okay, matter in and of itself was not evil. God made it, and it was very good. Now, we've corrupted it, that's for sure. Okay, but God can make it new. He can restore it, as we're going to see. All right, so what does Scripture teach? Well, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Which temple? Yeah. His body. What's going to raise up? His body. Not a different one. Not a spiritualized one. It's the body is going to rise again. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrifying, terrified, thinking they saw a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why, do your doubts, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. He comes right out and says, I'm not this spiritual thing. I'm right here. Physical. Jesus appears at 11. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of their joy and were amazed, he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate, and ate it in front of them. Do you know what Jesus did when he appeared to the disciples over and over again in the New Testament? He ate things. He walked with them. He talked with them. He drank things. He let them touch him. He showed them physical. In every way possible that you can do it, physical. That's what he was demonstrating. Not spiritual in the sense that there's no physical body there, and yet we have so many people who will look at those plain words and reinterpret them to say it was just a spiritual thing. Because their eschatology, their view of the end times, where they want to spiritualize everything, causes them to reinterpret the plain meaning of the text. So how about our resurrection bodies? What's that going to be like? Here's what Romans 8 says. For the earnest expectation of creation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. What's the adoption? The redemption of our body. It's not a spiritual existence for all eternity. It's a physical existence for all eternity in a body. Okay, I know some of you are thinking, oh, 
I don't want this body for all eternity. <laughs> don't worry, the first will be last, and the last will be first. I'm going to be short and have great hair. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not what he's talking about. That is misapplying that scripture. I just want you to know. That's a joke. Um, but you won't imagine. Uh, I did the half marathon yesterday in Georgia. Some of you, you were here that last night knew that. I'm sore today. Okay? okay? I won't be in eternity. Oh. You know, in the New Jerusalem, even if I walk 40 miles in one day, I'm not going to be sore the next day. Wow. That would be so neat. Okay? And that's not the coolest thing. It's going to be, for a lot of other reasons, it's going to be really cool. But, um, all right, how about in 1 John 3, 2? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he is revealed, what's he going to be? Physical glorified body, and we are going to be like that, physical, glorified body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I mentioned this one a little bit ago, this whole chapter is all about physical resurrection. The first, like, first half of the chapter, so 58 verses, the first half of the chapter is all about Christ's physical bodily resurrection. The last half is all about our future physical bodily resurrection. So also is the resurrection, resurrection of the I can't read. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. What's raised in incorruption? The body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. We'll come back to that. Uh, well, actually, let's take a look at that spiritual body because some people will look at that and say, "See, spiritual." Okay. Um, the Greek there is pneumaticon soma. Every time the word soma appears in the New Testament, it refers to a physical body. It's not saying that you're just going to be a spirit, some ethereal thing floating around. It's saying you're going to have a body that is controlled by the spirit, contrasted with the flesh. Because right now our bodies are controlled by that, right? Or we struggle against the flesh. We're not necessarily controlled by that. We have the Holy Spirit empowering us to fight against that. But when we're when we're glorified, we're not going to have that sinful flesh anymore. We're not going to be tempted by those desires and all those other things that, that bog us down right now. So we'll have a spirit-dominated or spirit-controlled body. That's what it's talking about. Paul says later on in 1 Corinthians 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So some people will look at the beginning of that and say, See, it says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So we're going to be spiritual, right? No, flesh and blood refers through, throughout the New Testament, whenever it's used, so five times in the New Testament, twice in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, primarily refers to our, our mortality, not physicality. Earlier we saw where Jesus talked about a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. As he said, I have flesh and bones refers to physicality. Flesh and blood refers to mortality. Okay? The context of the passage that we just read refutes the whole idea that we're just spirit. The corruptible must put on incorruption. The mortal must put on immortality. It doesn't become spirit. It puts on those things. The corruptible body becomes incorruptible. Okay? This, so the pe people who say that it's just a spirit, they point to passages where someone has trouble seeing, or trouble understanding what they're seeing, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they say, see, it must be spiritual. No, just because somebody doesn't know what they're seeing, it doesn't mean that they didn't see him. They did see him. They ignore the descriptive passages that explain Jesus' physical body, like destroy this temple, or spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. So they ignore those clear ones and then change the obvious meaning of the other ones to, pu to push their view. Okay, and um, the whole idea of physical bodily resurrection, by the way, that matches Jewish expectations, doesn't it? When Jesus asked Martha about her brother Lazarus, who has died, she said, I believe he'll rise again at the resurrection of the last day. That's what they believed. The Jews believed in physical bodily resurrection. They just thought it was going, to be, was going to happen at the end. They didn't understand the Messiah was going to rise first and be the first fruits. Jesus is never challenged by anybody, the Jewish people, when he was speaking about a future resurrection. Because they believed that, other than the Sadducees. But the Pharisees believed it. The average Jewish person at that time believed it. Daniel 12, 2 talks about the, both the righteous and the wicked rising. To judgment. Okay? 
Uh, those who sleep in the earth will rise. Both the wicked and the righteous are going to be uh, raised and resurrected and then, some, and then judged, some to eternal life and some to condemnation. In the book of Second Maccabees, which is not in our Bible, it's, a, uh, um, it's more of a historical book written during the intertestamental period, but there's a passage of seven brothers who are all tortured because of their belief. And over and over again, they emphasize this belief that, go ahead and do that to my body because it's, I'm going to rise again. So they had a, this concept of the, um, the, of the body rising from the dead. That's what they believed. And that passage, by the way, might be what is in view at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about women receiving their sons back. It might actually be an allusion to this passage in 2 Maccabees. Um, all right, so the whole idea of physical bodily resurrection matches what we see clearly taught in Scripture, matches the Jewish expectations. So what does that have to say about our future e eternal home? So we got the Christ's physical body, glorified body, our future glorified bodies, physical, right? Not spiritual. How about our eternal home? Physical. physical. The nature of Jesus' resurrection body and our future bodies impact how we view our eternal home. If, re if our resurrected bodies are physical, they will require a physical home, not a spiritual home. Okay? And yet, so many people avoid this topic. So in his um, book on the nature and destiny of man, you'd think that maybe he would cover this, right? Um, <laughs> Reinhold Niebuhr has two entire volumes, no mention of heaven at all. And he's talking about the destiny of man. William Shedd in his Dogmatic Theology, three volumes, thick volumes, 87 pages on eternal punishment, only two on heaven. Hmm. Kind of weird, isn't it? Charles Hodge, his systematic th theology, over 2,250 pages, only five of them on the kingdom of heaven. Anything related to this topic? Martin Lloyd-Jones, and by the way, I'm not saying these are bad preachers or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize these men, but his book, Great Doctrines of the Bible, 900 pages, less than two pages to the eternal state and the new earth. As if the topic barely matters at all. Louis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology, 38 pages on creation. Good job. A lot of people will avoid that. 40 pages on baptism and communion and 15 pages to the intermediate state and just two pages on hell and one page on the eternal state. A little bit imbalanced there, isn't it? And it's very common. People don't talk about it. So what is heaven? Well, the word can refer to a lot of different things. So you've got the, the Hebrew word is shemaim. And so you have... Um, it's the, it can be referring to our atmosphere, to what we would maybe refer to outer space. Uh, then you also have where God is currently sitting on his throne. So when Solomon is dedicating the temple in 1 Kings 8, then hear from heaven, O oh God, where God is currently at, in heaven. Okay? Um, here's what he said. Here's that part of that prayer. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and the temple which I have built for your name, then here in heaven, your dwelling place. Okay, that's where God currently dwells, heaven. Okay? It's the place where the spirits of believers currently go upon death. Right? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. So a believer who dies, to, if they were to die today, their spirit instantly goes to be with the Lord in heaven. And we kind of sang about that earlier, too. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I love that song. But what I'm going to be speaking about in a little bit shows that there's some things in there that aren't quite 100% accurate or they're conflating a few things because they also talk about the pearly gates. Mm. Pearly gates aren't on heaven. They're the new Jerusalem, the physical. This is the spiritual where God currently is. And it conflates those two. And you're going to see that. I still love the song, by the way. But there's just some things that, that aren't 100% uh, biblical if we think through this carefully. So it's also the place described in various visions of God's throne room in the Old Testament and New Testament. So in 1 Kings 22, you've got Micaiah, who talks about it, and then Isaiah 6, which we'll look at in just a moment, Revelation 4 and 5. So that's the place currently where God's throne is. And you see all the people before the throne and proclaiming these things in Revelation 4 and 5. Isaiah 6, here's what we read. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and he cried, 
And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's heaven now. Okay, that's where God's throne is. And again, that's where believers go at this point. But it is not our eternal home. That's not where we're going to end up for eternity. Craig Blazing said this, In the history of the church, many Christian theologians have claimed that the final state of the resurrection will be in heaven. And it's not accurate if you're thinking in terms of heaven being what the Bible says where God is right now. Okay? Now, what's happened, just like in the song, people conflate heaven with the new Jerusalem to make it one thing. And so that's what a lot of these theologians are doing. But I think we should be careful because we'll see there's two, they're very different places, as you're going to see in a little bit. Um, Middleton said this. He actually, um, this guy wrote a book called The New Heaven and New Earth. He's a post-millennialist, so I would disagree with quite a few of the things that he says, but there are several things that he pointed out in his book I thought were really helpful. And uh, this quote says, not only is the term heaven never used in scripture for the eternal destiny of the redeemed, but also continued use of heaven to name the Christian eschatological hope may well divert our attention from the legitimate expectation for the present transformation of our earthly life to conform to God's purposes. If we continue talking about heaven all the time and people think of it as just a spiritual existence, then it's going to impact the way we live our lives and what we think about our eternal state, as we've already read some quotes from people who thought, that doesn't sound all that exciting. I looked down at the bottom, he said, therefore, for reasons exegetical, theological, and ethical, I have come to repent of using the term heaven to describe the future that God has in store for the faithful. Now, that might be a little bit strong. It probably is. I mean, that's his own wording. Um, I have tried hard in the last several years, as I've been thinking about this, to not refer to the place where we're going to be living eternally as heaven but it's still very hard to overcome that because it's, it's so ingrained and you see it like in songs that we sing. Um, so I, I'm not trying to say, if you've ever done this, repent. Okay, I'm, what I'm trying to say is let's try to be careful and precise in how we speak about these things. And you're going to see why in a little bit why this makes such a big deal. Or maybe you've already caught it. Uh, here's what John says. The, now I saw, this is the verse, one of the verses we read earlier, a few of the verses. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So wait, the place where God was, is, and where people are going, that first heaven passes away? That's what it says, right? Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. So this is something new. It's not the current place where God dwells. Revelation 21 and 22 describes the city with streets of gold that will be the eternal dwelling place of redeemed humanity. And it is a different place than the current heaven. How do we know? Let's compare. In Revelation earlier chapters, up through chapter 20, you have the current heaven described. It has a crystal sea, correct? In Revelation 4, 6. In 21, 1, there is no more sea. It's a different place. There's a temple described in uh, Revelation 11, 19 and Isaiah 6, 1. We just talked, we just read that. Versus there's no temple in the New Jerusalem because it's a different place. It's not the same place. It's not, the current heaven is not visible from earth except for in Revelation 21, 24, the kings of the earth come to it. It is physical. It's visible. In Revelation 12, 8, we read, we're going to read this passage in a little bit. It's defiled by Satan. The current heaven has been defiled by Satan. It needs to be purged. It needs to be cleansed. And Revelation 21, 27 talks about the New Jerusalem. There's no possibility of defilement. These are different places. So to make them the same thing forces a bunch of contradictions into the text. Here's what Revelation 12 says, and you guys are probably familiar with this passage. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had, where she had a place prepared by God so that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I happen to believe that is a future event, 
A lot of people think that's something that already happened in eternity past. I don't believe that for a moment. Um, he still had access to heaven in Job. And if you continue reading on here, um, you see what is said to the inhabitants of the earth. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, I'm talking about Satan, who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So he's still there accusing the brethren. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth for this, this, and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. That's something that is still future. All right, Hebrews 9 says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The heavenly still need to be purged because Satan has defiled it. So it's something that's it's different than the New Jerusalem where nothing that can ever defile will ever be able to enter it. So, which is right here, 21, 27. But there shall by, by no means enter into it enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, so how have we missed this? Randy Alcorn coined this phrase, and I, or this term, and I think it's very accurate. He called it crystal platonism. So it's what Christians in the early centuries of the church combined Christian beliefs with Greek philosophical Platonic or Neoplatonic ideas that the physical is the bad and we need to get rid of that and be spiritual. And people have used that to reinterpret what scripture teaches on this. So it's an adoption of what's called the spiritual vision model of interpreting. So spiritual realities are elevated above physical realities. And you'll see how people do this and reinterpret scripture based on, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, so Alcorn talks about how it's a influence of Platonic dualism, spirit, good, matter, evil. The plain meaning of living as resurrected beings in a resurrected society, in a resurrected city, on a resurrected earth cannot be real because it doesn't jibe with the Platonic assumption that the body is bad and the spirit is, the body is, body is bad. How about I say it the right way? Body is bad and the spirit is good. So they'll reinterpret the plain meaning because it doesn't fit their Platonic ideas. So here is from Leon Morris, who is a respected uh, commentator. He's in his Revelation commentary, he says this, But when John speaks of streets paved with gold, of a city whose gates are made of single pearls and the like, we must not understand him to mean that the heavenly city will be as material as present earthly cities. It is his way of bringing out the very great value of what God has for his people. He is concerned with spiritual states, not with physical realities. No. It's a physical place. That's how it's describing it. So why would we inter reinterpret all these things that are described physically? Because our physical glorified bodies are going to need a physical place to dwell, and that's what we're going to have. Here's Kim Riddlebarger in his book, Case for Amillennialism. This is where a lot of this comes from. Amillennialism spiritualizes many of these things. And here's what he says. If the New Testament writers spiritualize Old Testament prophecies by applying them in a non-literal sense, they don't, by the way. New Testament authors never spiritualize the Old Testament prophecies. They're fulfilled in a straightforward way. Okay? Then the Old Testament passage must be seen in light of the New Testament interpretation, not vice versa. No, the Old Testament can stand on its own. What he's saying is that you never really could understand the Old Testament. The Jews had no hope of understanding it until the New Testament comes along and shows us how we're supposed to interpret all of that and reinterpret. Not, you, don't re, you don't interpret it physically. You reinterpret it spiritually. No. Okay, remember, red bars, not good. Okay. All right. So problems with crystal Platonism, it reinterprets Old Testament texts without justification, seeking to spiritualize them rather than in a straightforward way. So when it talks about uh, the Jews having a, a earthly kingdom with the Messiah ruling over them, nah, it wasn't really for the Jews. It's just talking about heaven for all believers. No, it's actually talking about for the Jews, as we'll see. So the text can't possibly mean what it says. It reflects Greek thinking rather than Jewish thinking. So spiritualizing, allegorizing became popular in the 4th century, and it's remained popular ever since, even among people today, who, some people who we consider to be cons uh, conservative Christians. They still have this tendency, in many cases, to spiritualize certain things. In Acts chapter 1, Right before Jesus ascends into heaven. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What were the Jews, what were the disciples expecting? They just traveled and walked and talked and lived with Jesus for several years. And they're still expecting a physical kingdom, right? Does he say, you boneheads, haven't you been with me so long? How, that's not going to happen, dummies. That's not what he says. 
Look what he says. It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, uh, be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He didn't say, no, that's never going to happen. He said, it's not for you to know the times. In other words, yeah, it's going to happen, just not right now. But look at how these people interpret it. Here's what Jay Adams said. The ascension immediately answered their question about the kingdom. Jesus would not remain on earth to head up an earthly kingdom for Israel. That's not what it says. How about N.T. Wright, one of the most well-respected theologians, say historians and everything. Here's what he says. In, by the way, in this book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, fantastic book, except for this paragraph. is awful. But the rest of it is really good. When the disciples at the start of Acts ask Jesus if this is the time for him to restore the kingdom of Israel, he tells them that they will receive power, true, and will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, true. The answer to their question, in other words, is yes, but in a redefined sense. No. That's not his answer to the question. He's not saying, oh yeah, the kingdom's going to be something completely different. It's the church. No. It's not for you to know when the Father's going to do this to restore the kingdom of Israel. That's what he said. He didn't say, yeah, let's redefine kingdom. Not at all. Therefore, when they had come together, he asked them, they asked him, Lord, well, here, there's just the explanation right there, um, underlining the verses. So, all right, the, the apostles anticipated a physical kingdom on the physical earth with their physical Messiah ruling over a physical people. Why? Because the Old Testament promised that over and over and over again. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't need to. Because he can make it happen. He's going to. Just because it doesn't fit the way that some people want to interpret it, doesn't matter. That's still going to happen. Jesus never corrected their belief. In fact, he affirmed their belief. He taught them that, as we'll see. He said that it was not for them to know the timing, but let's take a look at what, uh, here's what Alcorn said. We're going to read a verse in a little bit where Jesus actually taught that. Bible-believing Jews in the first century were not foolish to think that the Messiah would be the king of the earth. They were wrong about the Messiah's identity when they rejected Christ, and they were wrong to overlook his need to come as a suffering servant to redeem the world, but they were right to believe that the Messiah would forever rule the earth. Amen. Jesus said this, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging the tribes of Israel. That doesn't sound like a spiritual existence for a while, does it? And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Sure sounds physical, doesn't it? What possible reason could be given for the detailed description of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 22 if it's all supposed to just be spiritualized? Why would you go through so much detail describing the city? And, um, but I hope you notice all the Jewish elements in it. Okay. Um, that were described there. Why explain the physical dimensions and the makeup of the foundations, the gates, etc., if it's all just going to be spiritualized away? If the kingdom and our eternal home are spiritualized, then how can there be a restoration of all things? There can't be. When will the wolf dwell with the lamb and the lion eat straw like an ox? Never in that view. So you just spiritualize away all of Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65? Eh, it's not going to happen. But that's what they were expecting because that's what God promised them. God created matter and called it very good. While the ground is cursed and humans are sinful, matter in and of itself is not wicked or sinful. So it shows the need for a new creation, not a dematerializing of humanity. We don't need to get rid of matter altogether and just become spiritual. We need to be glorified. We need to be re restored. Okay? So how we missed it is because, as I mentioned before, people are conflating two different things. They're conf confusing the current heaven with the new Jerusalem. But Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Right now, where, heaven, where God is in heaven, lay up for yourself treasures. Sure, of course. That makes perfect sense. Um, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you have that truth that we're supposed to be longing for or working toward the things that are going to have eternal value. And um, you see the similar thing in Colossians. If you, then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. That's in heaven right now. We're supposed to seek those things. Okay? Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. It doesn't mean that we won't have a physical eternity. Just means right now we're working for things that have eternal value. We should be focused on Christ and what He's done, not on 
all the physical things that are in this earth right now. So confusing the current, so what happens, people confuse the current heaven with the new Jerusalem. As I mentioned before, the spirits of believers currently dwell with the Lord in heaven, but using the term heaven to refer to both the current place and the new Jerusalem in the new heaven and the new earth leads to confusing these two realities. So a question for you, and I don't have time to get into all of this, but just a thought experiment. Have we maybe done the same thing with hell? Absolutely. And I put hell in quotes because um, what is translated as hell in the Bible is not necessarily the same thing as the lake of fire. Maybe it is, but maybe not. Okay? The, all of these terms, a lot of people look at all of them. These are the different words used for the place of where people go when they die. Or the, There's several different meanings here. Um, the term sheol is the, the Hebrew word there. It's the Old Testament for the place of the dead. Okay? The pit is Old Testament for the grave and or the place of the dead. So sometimes you have righteous people who are going down to Sheol or the pit. It doesn't mean that they're, this is the same place as the lake of fire. Okay? Uh, you have Gehenna 12 times in the, old, in, in the Gospels and James. It's translated as hell. Uh, Tartarus is used one time, 2 Peter 2, 4. It's the place where the um, angels who sinned are held in chains of darkness. If you want more about that, read Fallen. Um, that's I get into that quite a bit, actually get into this topic in more detail. Um, and actually, it's a Greek word where, the, if you know Greek mythology at all, that's where the Titans are imprisoned by Zeus um, in Tartarus. And so Peter actually uses that word. Uh, the abyss uh, is used in the Gospels and also in Revelation. It's a place where, the remember the demons that were going to be cast out begged not to be sent there? And then Revelation talks about some of these evil spirits ascending out of the bottomless pit. Um, and Satan actually being cast there for a time. And then Hades, the New Testament, New Testament place for the dead, uh, that's mentioned 11 times, Lake of Fire is used four times. And what happens, people automatically lump all these things together. And they shouldn't be. Now, some of them may be referring to the same place. I don't have time to get into all of them. I do want to just give you a little bit of a, a picture here. Let's take a look at this word, Gehenna. And that is the, um, essentially the word for Valley of Hinnom which if you, were a, if you were a Jew in the first century and you heard Jesus talk about Gehenna, what, where would your mind go? It would go right here. That's Jerusalem. You can see on the middle right there, the big rectangular thing, that's the Temple Mount. And right now you can see the Dome of the Rock on there. The yellow strip here on the southwestern and southwest side of Jerusalem there, that is the Hinnom Valley. And so when Jesus says Gehenna, that's what they would have heard. That's exactly what they would have thought of. Is that the lake of fire? Okay, but it describes a place where the worm does not die, where, where there is burning, because it was apparently an on, like a continual burning garbage dump. And so is he saying, if you call your brother a fool, you're going to burn in hell for all eternity? Are you going to go to the lake of fire? Or is he saying, this is your future? Maybe like it's a dishonorable burial where the birds will eat you or where the worms will eat you, that kind of thing. And so there's debate about that, but just understand that now maybe he's just using it as a metaphor for the lake of fire. That's the way many people will take it. And I'm not going to argue against that. I just want you to think about how would they have understood this at that time. Um, that's what it looks like on the, you can see how deep that valley is running along the, the right side and the bottom there of the old city. In fact, here's a picture of me from last year walking through hell. Um, <laughs> it was hot that day, um, but we were, that's in the Hinnom Valley right there. Uh, that's where some of the kings of Israel sacrificed their children, made them pass through the fire. Okay, so there was an, a lot of abomination that took place there. Um, all right, so uh, maybe the same thing happens with Hades. A lot of times people will, will say that that's the same thing for the lake of fire, except for death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire, so they're not the same thing. Okay, at the final judgment. Um, and actually, when they heard Hades, they may be thought of something like this. This is in the very far north end of Israel. And see that big cave on the left there? And on the right, you can see that those alcoves there. Let me get closer up there with me. Stand next to it. That was the temple of Pan in the first century. When Jesus says in Matthew 16, who do people say that I am, the Son of Man? Am? And some said Elijah. Some said, you know, they, they believe he's a prophet. Uh, but who do you say that I am? Uh, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Do you know where they were at that time? Right there. It says they came to Caesarea Philippi. That's right there. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood not revealed this to you, but, to my, but my father in heaven. Um, then he says, I say that to you that you are 
Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Do you know what they believed was right there inside that huge cave? The gates of Hades. And do you know what's right there above that? That ginormous rock is Mount Hermon, the biggest mountain in the whole region. And so Jesus goes right to the place of all of these pagan gods and said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, the gates of Hades. That's where their minds are going. Okay, today we instantly think hell, lake of fire. We, we have all these pictures about like the devil running, you know, the lake. Of, no, he's not going to be running that place. He's going to be suffering for all eternity, I think, worse than anybody throughout history because he's done the most evil of anybody. And people are going to be, ju- the people and angels are going to be judged according to their works who are being thrown into the lake of fire. So I think his torment will be far worse than anyone. So anyway, just keep those things in mind as we, as we try to read carefully. And that would be several talks all together just to try to get to the bottom of that. And I don't know that I'm even qualified to do it. Pastor, right there, you go. You can, you can, you can do some more teaching on that and, and correct where I might be wrong. All right, so resurrection requires physical. And the resurrection of Jesus reveals what our resurrected body will be like. It's physical, not spiritual. And physical bodies require a physical place just as described in Scripture. So how have we missed it? Well, I think because we avoid the topic or because we misunderstand it. This one, shame on me. You can, <clears throat> you can find an example of this in my book, God and Cancer, which is out on the table. Just know that I misused this verse in the print version. I corrected it on the Kindle version instantly, but it's still in print. Um, but, I, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, the, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. How many times have you heard this used to talk about how great eternity will be? It's going to be far beyond anything we can imagine. Now, I think it's true. It'll be far beyond what we can possibly imagine. I think we can imagine a lot. I think we can read Revelation 21 and 22 and get a good glimpse of it, but I think it's still going to be better than what we can possibly imagine. But that's not what that verse says. Let's read the context. But we speak the wisdom of God in a, mis- in a, in a mystery, the hidden wisdom f- which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. How can it be about future eternity that we can't possibly imagine when the very next line he says, but God has revealed them? Because when Paul's talking about mystery and everything, he's talking about like the church age. The Jews in the Old Testament did not see that coming. That was not revealed to them yet. But because they rejected their Messiah at the first coming, now you have this, if you want to call it an interim, whatever the church is here, that was the mystery that Paul talks about over and over again. But now that has been revealed. That's what it's about. So I misused that verse, and a lot of us do, because we want to, we, we want to think of how wonderful eternity will be. Uh, so why does it matter? Randy Alcorn again said, I've collected more than 150 books on heaven, many of them very old and out of print, and I've read nearly all of them. One thing I've found is that books about heaven are notorious for saying that we can't know what heaven is like, but it will be more wonderful than we can imagine. However, the moment we say that, that we can't imagine heaven, we dump cold water on all that God has revealed to us about our eternal home. If we can't envision it, we can't look forward to it. If heaven is unimaginable, why even try? Everything pleasurable we know about life on earth we have experienced through our senses. So when heaven is portrayed as beyond the reach of our senses, it doesn't invite us. Instead, it alienates and even frightens us. Our misguided attempts to make heaven sound spiritual, that is non-physical, merely succeed in making heaven sound unappealing. John Eldridge, let me... There we go. I didn't want to miss this one. Uh, Randy Elkhorn said, A woman wrote to me, I've been a Christian since I was five. I'm married to a youth pastor. When I was seven, a teacher at my Christian school told me, When I get to heaven, I wouldn't know anyone or anything from earth. I was terrified of dying. I was, ne- I was never told any different by anyone. It's been really hard for me to advance in my Christian walk because of this fear of heaven and eternal life. How can you have a fear of what God has in store for us? Because if you have a misunderstanding of it, then it doesn't sound all that great. John Eldridge said this, Nearly every Christian I have spoken with has some idea that eternity is an unending church service. We have settled on the image of a never-ending sing-along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever. Amen. And our heart sinks. Forever and ever? That's it? That's the good news? And then we sigh and feel guilty that we are not more spiritual. We lose heart and we turn once more to the present to find what, to find what life we can. So... What hope are we offering the unbelieving world? A bodiless eternity that is practically incomprehensible to our minds and, or one that sounds quite boring? 
or an eternal home where our bodies never break down or hurt and where there'll be no more sorrow, pain, tears, or curse, a new creation where we have eternity to explore and enjoy in physical body, glorified bodies that won't be sore the day after a half marathon. Okay? A place where the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Okay? Where there will be no more hurting, no more sorrow, anything like that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ offers us hope right now. It guarantees the truth of the Christian message. It guarantees that our Lord is alive and interceding for us. It guarantees that he will raise us to life. The resurrection guarantees that our eternal home will not be boring in any way at all. There's no need to fear or dread our eternal home. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen? Amen. All right, let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the picture of eternity that you've given us. And yes, we do believe that it's going to be grander than we can fully comprehend. But you have given us a picture in the last two, books of, last two chapters of Revelation to help us comprehend something about it and to help, help us know, uh, Lord, the, the most encouraging thing, that you are there with us and will dwell with us and there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. We look forward to that day. Lord, until that time comes, help us to be faithful to you so that someday we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the, the grave, defeating death. And Lord, also help us to understand or help us to share what will come as a result of that. Not only are we forgiven of our sins, but we'll dwell with you eternally in glorified bodies in a home where there will never be any corruption that we will get to enjoy and explore for all eternity and we'll never be bored. Father, thank you for this, this glorious truth. Thank you that you did not leave us in our sin as we deserve, but you sent your son to redeem us and to take our place on that cross. Lord, help us to live our lives out of gratitude for what you've done. We pray these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.